has fallen to the ground. Father, we praise you this morning. We adore you. We ascribe to you strength and honor and glory and power and riches and wisdom. Father, we praise you that you have established your king on Mount Zion. And that as the nations scoff and as they rage against him, as they claim to have the power to tear off whatever binds them to you, you laugh from heaven because you do your will, Father, in the heavens and the earth and under the earth. And no man can say to you, what are you doing? All the nations, Father, are like a drop in a bucket and less than nothing. Lord, kings will be born today and kings will die. But your administration never changes. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, in the midst of these times, corruption, greed, stupidity, arrogance, men being vile, hating and hating one another. It is a testimony to the truth of your word that men are depraved and need a savior. That the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. That although they knew God, they did not honor him as God nor give thanks. <coughs> They became foolish, futile in their speculations. Father, though all men be liars, you are true, and your word is true. Father, we never want to take for granted who you are. If you were not pure, if you were not holy, if you were not just, the idea of God would be a terrifying reality. But you are pure and holy and just, <clears throat> compassionate, full of loving kindness, showing your mercy to a thousand generations of those who love you. Father, this day we're gathered here to know your Son, to consider him, to behold him, Father, as one would behold a multifaceted diamond, turning it into light, Father. I pray that we would see him. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're sitting here today and we are going to consider some things about the Son. We're on page 48. We're talking about the reasons for which Christ came. He came for the love of His people. He came for the glory of God. He came for the great joy that was set before Him. And part of that great joy set before Him was His exaltation. He looked forward to returning to the Father. He looked forward to receiving not only a glory that He had with the Father before the foundation of the world, but even a greater glory. He looked forward of reigning in the light of having redeemed a people for Himself. It's absolutely amazing. 
that through Him, through His submission to the Father, His incarnation, His kinesis, His self-emptying, His becoming a man, He gained for Himself a people. He did it as God. He did it as man. And now He is returning to the Father. Something that we spoke on last week that is so very, very important. There is a sense in which Christ returns to the glory He had before the foundation of the world with the Father. There is another sense in which He returns to a far greater glory. Not just the magnitude of glory because of what He has done, but the fact that now He takes that glory upon Himself in the body of a man. A glorified man. So when we talk about Philippians chapter 2 and Christ laying aside His glory, becoming man, you have to realize that it's the only time in history where the subtraction is actually an addition. He lays aside His glory. He did not become something less than God. He became something more than God. He became something God had never been. And that is also man. And he had to become man to work redemption and to save a people. And now He's going back to the Father. Let's go to John 17.24. Father, I desire that they also, whom You have given Me, be with Me where I am, so that they may see My glory, which You have given Me. For You loved Me before the foundation of the world. Now, the word desire comes from the Greek word telo, which may be translated to will. And so it's not just I desire, but, but I will. Many uh, old scholars uh, refer to this as the last will and testament of Christ for His people. It's not only His desire, it is His strong will. He is determined for what to happen. We look at it, that we be with Him and that we see His glory. That we be with Him and see His glory. Seeing the glory of another is even common in, in fallen man by the common grace of God. What do I mean by that? If a father sees his son doing either a moral deed or performing some great athletic feat or some heroic uh, thing, he glories in what his son has done. A son should, in a sense, glory in his father. Little boys think their dad, rightly, think their dad is Superman. They glory in their father. So even in our fallen world, we can, we can see men getting joy from glorying in the glory of another. Well, in heaven, that will be our joy. It will be our joy, His exaltation. It will be our joy to see all great things ascribed to Him. Now, um, John Trapp writes, Every word is full of life. I would not, saith Mr. Baxter, for all the world, that one verse had been left out of the Bible. Now see, you can read this text, look at it, and be nonchalant and not realize that it's one of the greatest texts in the entire Bible with regard to the future grace given the believer. You just read over it so quick to get to something else. What you need to realize, you never read quickly in the Bible to get to the good stuff because it's all the good stuff. Father, I desire that they also, whom You have given Me, be with Me where I am. I can tell no one in this room understands this text. Or either you're all sleeping. Because if you understood this text, you'd be breaking forth in tears, you'd be shouting for joy, you'd be jumping over tables, we'd have to restrain you. I mean, after all, if, a, if a, an official or assistant of Bill Gates walked in the door right now and said, uh, Bill Gates has desired, de decided to give you a million dollars, or two million dollars, you'd be ecstatic. You'd be calling everybody on the phone. 
mom, dad, friends, everybody. You couldn't even stay in the class. You'd leave.